Zimbabwe War of Liberation. It was also called the Second Chimaringa, meaning the second oh, fight for freedom. So what you're getting from me is just one half of the story, and I implore you to go and uh, check in the other half. My degree is in journalism. So uh, for all the hard news stories, you have to realize exactly what's going on here. There are two kinds of stories in the newspaper business. Hard news stories, which should be balanced, and the other story is an editorial, which pushes one point of view. So technically, what I'm giving you now is an editorial. You take, so take it with a grain of salt. You're not getting... You're not getting the full picture spectrum. You're getting about one half spectrum, one angle. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, my unit, uh, first of all, I'm going to go through through a few of these slides here. And this is the first time I've been asked to give this talk, oddly enough. So it's the first uh, first kind, first of ever. And we'll see if we can get this going here. But this is uh, the baobab. <coughs> It's an upside down tree that could well be 12 feet in diameter. You see all this all over southern Africa. And you notice the bush around it, the little hills. Don't think of southern Africa as being a jungle. And also, the weather in, for instance, Rhodesia, pretty much is, is very much like those 85, 84 degree days we had all summer, <coughs> those 90 days. Uh, southern Africa is close to Antarctica. Don't think of high temperatures. Uh, it was really beautiful most of the time, is beautiful most of the time. Um, so that's a uh, small introduction. Now let's, let's go, keep going. This didn't come out quite so well as I hoped, but let's use this pen. And this, push it. Here we go. Um, this is uh, the southern third of, of Africa. Um, and this is where uh, Werner's, Werner Vosloh's ancestors, landed in about 1680. His Dutch ancestors landed right there. So this is his part of the world. In his, uh, I was involved in what we considered a uh, very much a Cold War chapter, and so was Werner's father. So we, we, he and I, Lawrence and I, are both what we consider Cold War chapter um, veterans. Uh, so in any case, Zimbabwe is up here. Now, Zimbabwe used to be called Rhodesia until April of, 19, of, of uh, 1980. And this entire area here was an, an inc incredible hotbed since about 1960 uh, through, uh, through 1980 of liberation struggles, which, and again, this is opinion, which in fact were backed by, uh, backed by uh, either Russia or China. <coughs> In Zimbabwe, both Russia coming from the west and the Chinese coming through Mozambique from the east, training, uh, training uh, tribes, a certain tribe there coming in, and this, they were in fierce competition. Let me go through here, and we'll, we'll pick up with that later. Fierce competition. I want to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I was a newspaper reporter on, on four different dailies. This was on the Houston Post. This is before I joined the U.S. Army. And here, I'm going to make incredibly critical comments about Southern culture, about African culture. You'll hear me make really sarcastic derogatory, but it's against the culture. And it's strictly opinion against the culture. It's not against the people or the capability. This is Houston, Jack Yates High School, Jack Yates High School, all black, public high school. Their scores were <coughs> equaling all the white scores. Fantastic school, all black. And I'm getting honored for a civil rights campaign. I was the top civil rights reporter in Houston, male, that year. For a police brutality case, by the way, interesting, but from Conroe, Texas, involving police brutality against two white gangs from an area called Cut and Shoot. So, but I was honored in any case, by the school. That's the senior right there who put on the whole program. <coughs> That's me as a, as a Green Beret officer, but I got snagged into staff duty during my year in Vietnam. So I'm a staff officer and was very frustrated by that. I was a fully qualified uh, Green Beret officer. That's my Green Beret over there. And so I was frustrated. That's the command of all the Green Berets, and that's me getting a bronze star, but not for valor. It's for exceptional achievement in a uh, combat zone. 
So I'm a frustrated guy. I've just been through a war and didn't participate with all my training at the School of Infantry Fort Benning, Georgia, and at Fort Bragg. That's me uh, seven years later in front of my African soldiers. And they are carrying, by the way, you'll see some interesting things here. You'll see this, they're carrying precisely this particular rifle called an FN. And by the way, I personally checked, they've all been cleared, you know, so I'm not pointing it at anybody. This was a, something designed in Rhodesia. I, I hadn't seen it for 35 years. It was designed to keep the rifle from jumping up on, uh, let's say, bursts of three or four. So it's very nostalgic seeing it. There's something else here. Eric is fond of camouflage, uh, uh, <laughs> camouflaging, in which we were given paint just like this. This is camouflaged just like the rifles in the Rhodesian Army were camouflaged. Not so evident here, though, is one of these guys here, this particular fellow, you can see on the print, he had an artistic flair, and his was polka dots. <laughs> uh, yellow polka dots uh, on, uh, on, a whole, on all green rifle. This is a 60 millimeter, which is used to this day by our rangers all over, uh, all over Afghanistan. Uh, that was the closest thing to artillery we had. Uh, I think you're going to see actually one of these things on, uh, on one of these. We use them to keep the, the rifle from uh, moving upward. Now, a, a little, so I came into Rhodesia, did, signed a three-year contract and ended up serving for 37 months. It was a wonderful, enjoyable thing, and it was an easy, easy transition. The, the, so far as leadership goes, it's exactly the kind of leadership you operate in your business. You treat everybody fairly. You don't single anybody out. When over there, uh, so you, you praise somebody when they have a good shot, when they, when they do something exceptional. It's no different. The leadership tactics are not one bit different in Africa than they are here or in any business. It all, it's all exactly the same. It was like one big country club. It was very much a regimental system, a British colonial regimental system. Everybody was friendly. It was a very pleasant, pleasant experience. This is one of our heroes. That's the Silver Cross of Rhodesia. This is a fellow called, he was the, he would be the uh, first sergeant normally, but they call him company sergeant major in, in the whole British system. His name is Chitterica and he's fantastic. <coughs> and while we were going through this last night with the lady who arranged it, which is next Nicole Alexander, she went to her computer and found <coughs> relatives of this man in Harare, uh, Zimbabwe, which is in fact used to be Salisbury. So Chitterica is his name and his relatives are out there and are findable. It's a, there's a wonderful, happy, joking relationship there. That's, again, uh, at a, a funeral ceremony, whenever one of our soldiers from the entire battalion, and we had five companies, would get killed, it didn't, didn't matter what part of the uh, Rhodesia he was in, and because the communist terrorists, and we call them CTs for short, <coughs> were in all of the tribal trust lands. And they were everywhere. And what we did was go out to the tribal trust lands in this country, which is no bigger than Montana. The good point about that is the drive to work was sometimes a couple of hours. So, but whenever one of our soldiers from the entire battalion would get killed, was the whole war stopped for us and we came back and had a huge ceremony. That's again in one of the, the many uniforms, including swords, which I, I gave to my, my, my daughter. And it, I didn't get it right, see that? <laughs> the Sam Brown belt. Uh, for morale building, about every four months, we would bring everybody into camp and have a big party. Um, this is a, there are only two kinds of beer, and that was, it would be Lion Beer and Castle. That was it. Uh, this is a, one of the, the white officers of the, uh, the Lieutenant uh, uh, one of my lieutenants at that time, I was a captain, uh, 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 Lieutenant Cook, just having a grand old time. And these would be a mix of mostly Shona, but Matabili. And the Matabili soldiers were an offshoot of the Zulus. Chaka Zulu killed so many of his people, uh, like about 50,000 of them, that they, 
those uh, as part of the tribe, part of his tribe, raced to the north up to out of South Africa up to an area called uh, um, Matabele, excuse me, Matabele land, Bulawayo, to get away from him. So part of my tribe was about five percent Matabele who were very warlike, and the other were Shona, or ten percent Matabele. Well, they faded each other for centuries, and so occasionally. One of my Manabila guys would get dressed up with his Asagai stabbing spear. Start, he would show up, start giving the beady eye to the Shonans. <laughs> used to kill him. <laughs> Slow things down. Old habits. <laughs> this is something that I got. We had an election. Uh, we had an election, a majority rule election in um, March of 1979. Uh, had it been recognized, the whole history would be different. Uh, but it was not recognized. It was uh, I was uh, cited for my help in securing a large section of Zimbabwe for the first majority rule election. Now, the fact that it was not uh, recognized <coughs> created a terrible tragedy. Robert Mugabe f failed to participate. We had guarantees from the U.S. government and from the British government that uh, that if we had a fair election and it was ruled to be fair, that it, it would be recognized. However, the Carter administration decided not to recognize it for what he called rules of national security. So this little landlocked country, uh, you know, the size of Montana, what the, we never did know the rules, but he did not recognize the election. election. And after that, uh, the, it was going to go the communist way. So that was quite a disappointment to us. This was a, again, uh, I'm, I was, I had a typhoid, pick up typhoid from drinking water on my hands and knees from a puddle no bigger than this. This is a great guy. Oh, anyway, he took out my, you can see the FN, he had just taken out my platoon and done, had done a great, on one of our five day patrols and done a wonderful job and had come back and I'm, I'm reading him there. It's a funny story I may get to. This is again, Company Sergeant Major Chitterica, and this is with Palomine, uh, one of our new black officers, but in Percy Chianica. He said as soon as he got commissioned, he said every relative he didn't know he had came over to see him to get him up for a loan. The <laughs> 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 great guy, uh, Brown's, the Browns Cross of Rhodesia, this guy. <coughs> so you could get some idea of the flavor. Uh, this was a uh, this guy was a Russian captured in Angola. Uh, the, Ch the, the Russians, using the Cubans, were busy involved in the communist movement through Angola. As a matter of fact, it was threatening, uh, threatening South Africa, and that's where Werner's uh, father was involved. In that, in that. And that went on, by the way, for a full decade after the Rhodesian War was over. And that was going concurrently with another Cold War chapter going on in Afghanistan called the Afghanistan War. So that the Cold War, our war ended in 79, uh, after, went all the way from basically 1965, when Ian Smith declared independence, all the way through November of 1979. Uh, and when that chapter ended, Afghanistan picked up. So we feel that our particular chapter was every bit as uh, important in the Cold War effort as, uh, let's say, Korea. Vietnam or any of the other chapters. But you see, I'm seeing it one way. Now these are, this is, this is a city of Salisbury. It was a lovely city with a tremendous amount of civility. Now I'll say that Portland, Oregon has that civility. They do have it. These ladies happen to be in uniform. I think they were police officers. Um, Everybody in Rhodesia was in uniform of one sort or, or another, except for just one or two people. So it, the nice feeling about Rhodesia was that everyone was aware that if they weren't out in the field fighting all the time, even top businessmen did a, a, a long tour, a rotating tour in the field. So there wasn't anyone who wasn't in uniform, and the women were extremely uh, supportive. Uh, they were heavy into morale boosting, sometimes at the expense of their marriages. So, um. Now that's me, the, the day I got out, that's where the jackal, 
So I wanted to go through some of the tactics we use. Well, I, I want to back up a little bit and tell you, uh, basically in, 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 in Mozambique, it would be on the east side, that's where the Chinese were gathering and training people and using, uh, that's where Mugabe got all of his support. They trained them there, they matched them, and they, they came right across the border of Mozambique into uh, the area of Mtali. Now, on the other side, in Zambia, they had something called the cathedral right outside of Lusaka, where two Russian colonels were there around the clock talking with a guy called Joshua Nkomo. So he was competing. In the last year, last two years of the war, there were huge battles as the uh, Chinese forces backing uh, 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 Mugabe's forces backed by the Chinese as they moved. They knew the war would be coming to the end, end shortly as they moved to the uh, and they were trying to take as much territory as they could, so they moved to the west. Meanwhile, the Russian-backed troops moved toward <coughs> the east, uh, so that whenever somebody blew the whistle and said, game's over, each one wanted to be in control. And I remember in 68, uh, and let's go back to that map. I'm going to go back to the map of, of uh, I'm going to go back to the map of, uh, let's see, I think got to catch up here. I was going to point to uh, point to where it was on the map, but let me show you the map. We'll do it this way. <coughs> First of all, this is a picture. Quite significant. That's an MAG, you recognize it. This is Chief Chirao's um, son, one of the chiefs who ran in the first majority rule election that we had. This is a a white soldier. The Rhodesian army itself was 68% black, and uh, there was never any, uh, when we to told up our casualties at the end, there's no division for blacks and whites. It was all considered a Cold War effort. In, this, in any case, in 78, in the middle of the country, I'd had a scene where we shot up some terrorists. Didn't kill anybody that day, but they left behind some very valuable documents. But while I'm calling all this information in the next morning, suddenly, about 10 kilometers to the north, we heard what sounded like the World War III. So I called up the headquarters and said, Sunray 1, this is Sunray 2. Uh, what's going on? Does someone need help? Uh, and he said, uh, no, it's, that's the two sides uh, <coughs> battling each other. It's on the zipper. Just, just stay out of the way. Let them go at it. <laughs> so, so they were each individually fighting us and fighting each other. And so it's so it quite a dynamic. So we stayed out of the way uh, in that situation. The Chinese communists were fighting the Russian communists? Yeah, basically, yes. Or the surrogates. <laughs> it was a proxy. Yeah. It was a proxy war mm -hmm. in which the uh, in which the various liberation movements throughout Southern Africa, uh, in fact, uh, used the very legitimate, uh, let's say, liberation aspira aspirations of the black population. The problem was with, with, with liberation was it never turned out to be liberation. It didn't turn out to be liberation at all. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, Zimbabwe is a classic case. Those people living in a real police state, terrorized, no one can do anything. So it was quite a sad situation. Very, very sad. And everyone knew it where we were at the time. Uh, the Carter administration and Andrew Young, Andrew Young would spend a lot of time there. We explained that to him in great detail. He's a former ambassador to the UN. Uh, and he's still quite prominent in politics. We said that, listen, of all the candidates running, Mugabe is the ringer. He's the bad guy, and he always will be bad. And that's the way it turned out. But no one could convince the Carter administration to recognize our election. So one year after our election, uh, there was another election with a lot of uh, a lot of skullduggery, a lot of pressure, and our particular top general went literally knocked on Maggie Thatcher's door and said, "Listen, you had promised that there's corruption or in this election that you would abrogate it." Well, Maggie Thatcher was just coming in, wanted to be rid of this dreadful business called Rhodesia, and she just looked the other way. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, she hadn't grown the, the steel spine; it was the weenie spine. <laughs> uh, but I want to go into the, uh, the tactics that he used. Let me turn this off for a second. 
So, sir, when you Go when you were in Africa, were you still U.S. Army or were you in their army? No, I was a regular member of the Rhodesian Army. Okay. Uh, As a matter of fact, I uh, signed a three-year commission paper. Oh, uh, that's right. You and I was a. Um, there were. Uh, I was getting about oh a thousand a month, yeah. what everybody else did. What Percy Chiniki got a thousand a month, a regular petty, regular regular soldier's pay. There was a rich in my life. I was in the force <laughs> for forty-two days out of fifty-two, and <laughs> so money piled up. When I came back, went to the best hotels, you know. Rich. But I want to show this. Uh, our tactics. <coughs> and it's the tactics that we use very effectively. And our kill ratio was 22 to 1. We killed 22 bad guys for every one of us that were killed. So I'm putting here a hammer and anvil so you can get some idea. I've never, by the way, given a talk, and I've heard very few talks um, on that, on what was going on there. I put these together last night. Just wanted to get the idea of hammer and anvil. Plus, my own code is the, the blue. These are the good guys, and the red are the communist guys. We call the com communist troops CTs, meaning communist terrorists. And every group of 12 that came across, they always had a commander, but they also had a political commissar who was the real power there, and he made things happen. So our tactic, you've heard it, it's a military <coughs> tactic called hammer and anvil, and I'll, as we go along, along, I'll explain that. So here I'm saying the good guys are in blue, <laughs> and the bad guys are in red. Oh, and I'm one of the good guys. <laughs> what have we done here? I didn't fold it over. The wrong way. Okay, this is a, a classic hammer and anvil deal. These are the good guys, all lined up in an assault position. And they will be on line, walking maybe five meters apart, just walking at a determined step with one of those in their hands and occasionally maybe stopping and firing at a target at one of the, at one of the terrorists, or else, uh, uh, or else just walking and firing, depending on how thick these people are. Now what you're looking at right now is a classic situation whereby the terrorists would be in the crawls and they killed, by the way, 9,000 locals by, by all kinds of various means. And the idea was to intimidate them, intimidate the locals into submission. So the, the, the guys in red are, uh, are the terrorists, each armed with an AK-47 or an SKS, uh, RPG-7. By the way, the RPG-7s were used at Benghazi. So that fantastic weapon, I don't know why we never had one on our side. Mm -hmm. But that is still used to this day as we're sitting here. This will be the same RPG-7 was used then. It's been used for 70 years, I'll bet. Fantastic weapon. So the, the bad guys were armed with uh, SKSs, AK-47s, what Greg and I saw in Vietnam. Everything we saw there, we saw there. And even a nifty little a machine gun called an RPD machine gun. And this one fired a kind of a rim thing. We also saw some PPSHs, which fires a talker off round. So, what happened is this assault group are sweeping this way, right through here. Usually, these guys break and run. And what has already been studied is the likely avenues of approach, uh, of, of departure. That is, little trails here, uh, valleys. Which way are these guys going to run? You've already pre-positioned what I'm going to call stop groups, which is usually a, a machine gunner and a rifleman. <laughs> right here. So these people will run right into these guys. Highly effective. Now you've just seen this is the tactic that was used in 95% of the, all the internal operations. This is the way it happened. Uh, the police, don't think of police as being people in the downtown street. These police, uh, called the British South Africa police, were in fact combat soldiers like everybody else. They had a police anti-terrorist unit. They were out on patrol. In the First World War, this particular crowd won two Victoria Crosses. So we're on the same radio, everyone was in constant communication, everyone knew exactly how the brain was working, there would be an assault group would start here and somebody else would start saying, well, I want a stop group here, a stop group here, and they would shout across the eight-digit grid coordinates from the map. 
Go here, go here. Now this is an actual operation done in 1973 which, which tells everything, uh, that will, brings everything together. A good friend of mine, David Scott Donlan, uh, actually eliminated the group called Forlisi. Now Forlisi was competing with these two groups I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Zanla, which was the, the Chinese backed, and Zipro, which was the Russian backed. Uh, this group wanted to take over from them and grab control of the entire so-called either liberation movement or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so the way this all started, uh, Scott Donlan got a call that a farmer had been shot. It had been very tranquil in this area in 1973, about <coughs> uh, 70 miles south east of the Salisbury, which is now Harare. They got there, found the dead farmer there, two, two crosses through his eyes. He had gone to investigate some noise, and suddenly got, he got shot by somebody with an, either an SKS or an AK-47 was shot once. Well, in this particular time, it was an absolute uh, winter, dead of winter. It was frozen. The ground was frozen. It was so frozen that hippos were dying. Highly unusual, but it was that cold. They looked around, found a, a, a small area with a tiny cave in it, uh, and in there they found packs. Uh, they had been left, left behind, and they found one strand of red wool. Sometimes the Africans would wear some strange colored wool, to, or maybe red socks, <coughs> hoping to keep the bullets away. But they, they couldn't find anything. This, he was part of, the, uh, of a very, very elite uh, tracking unit uh, called, a combat tracking, uh, called a combat tracker unit. So just three of them, one guy was sick, so just three of them, they spent several nights in nothing but their shorts and t-shirts, um, uh, practically freezing. They looked around and looked around for two days trying to find tracks, and really all they found were these packs of documents which they sent away to off to have analyzed. Well, finally, uh, on this second day, they found a little campfire here in another, uh, another red wool strand right around the campfire. They can't find any tracks because the ground is frozen. Well, they looked around. Uh, uh, Davis got down and looked around and said, Lord, where could these terrorists be? It's flat farmland here. So he looked over here, and there's a copy, and Werner, Werner will know exactly what I'm talking about. It was full of rocks as big as motel rooms, so I'm not getting this correctly. So very casually, he began walking over here with this group of three, and they walked around this thing. Meanwhile, the sun was coming up. It was getting warmer. They walked around this thing, saw no tracks at all. Uh, then they walked all up, walked very casually around the top. The sun is, it, meanwhile, is starting to warm up a little bit. Uh, right at the very top, there was a little bit of sand. He found what was called a heel strike, a heel strike from a boot. Uh, well, of course, he made the, the hair stand up on the back of his neck. And very, very casually, with the FN slung over their shoulders, not so loud, they, they walked again casually around here. So guess what? There's no, no tracks at all out, no tracks at all anywhere left. He immediately got on the phone with an hour, within an hour, <coughs> And a half, they had a whole bunch of people assembled, or when I say a whole bunch, probably maybe maximum 30. They quickly put together an assault line here, swept across here, but missed. Uh, they would just, they angled off, and, went, uh, and then they put together an assault line again. But before they did that, they put in stop groups. Again, stop groups. Here and here. There's a little bit of a rocky fence there, a rocky fence here. So they didn't have enough troops. They covered off this area. This was a road with a truck full of troops going back and forth, back and forth. They assaulted through here, flushed uh, nine people out of here. They ran into the guys with the FNs here and machine guns and were killed, properly killed. <coughs> and so this is a classic, uh, a classic thing of putting the head together, figuring out what's going on. And the Rhodesians followed up every single, uh, every single uh, follow-up. They did it. They didn't miss on anything. This is a, you've heard of Fire Force? 
This is fire forces where a Dakota loaded with uh, uh, loaded with 18, 17, between 17 and 18 soldiers would fly over an area and be dropped. He would, somebody, our, our, my particular unit did a lot of what's called OP. You would go out in the middle of the night, maybe walk into a tribal trust land, uh, 15 kilometers or so, get on top of a high point and watch a village for activity. And these are called akayas, and what you call a little village like that is called a crawl. So you would watch for terrorists inside of here. And when you saw them, uh, you would then uh, call in fire force. Fire force would drop uh, all of these paratroopers right here. Sometimes they made a mistake and dropped them right on the terrorists, and they would be firing with their FN down at the terrorists as they were coming down. But by then, they were so coordinated, my guys would come off the hill, we would get down in stop groups on likely avenues of retreat. The sweep line would come through, and there would be a contact back and forth, but eventually these guys all would leave and uh, depart the area uh, and run right into us. It was wonderful. <laughs> <coughs> So, uh, when you're in the bush, tactically, only three things that can happen. I'm going to go over these. <laughs> you see, th see them first, uh, and if you see them going toward a certain area, you try to cut them off and rush over there and ambush them. That's the first thing that happens. If you see them first, this is all old stuff to Greg. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see them first, you go and try to ambush them before they see you. Or they see you first, uh, and they, uh, they ambush you. And so what do you do if you're ambushed walking on a trail and you get ambushed? There's only one thing to do. If you're walking this way, you turn into it and fire. Walk right into the ambush and go to the top. And believe it or not, it sounds murderous, but a lot of people have come through those things without a single casualty. So you, there is no other choice. If you're ambushed on the trail, you have to turn in. You have to turn in. And, uh, so what happens if you both see each other? See each other at the same time? You attack each other. That's it. Now, I want to show you what, what's likely to happen, how to attack, and what is a, a common scenario. Okay, you see each other, and the other side, the bad guys, decide that they're going to uh, <coughs> stop and fight a while, get behind some rocks or stuff. Well, if you have 12 people with you, uh, let's say you have 10, you have break it up into, let's say, two different groups here, you become the assault group, you become the hammer, moving this way, but before you do that, you're, you need to get on the high ground and fire on these people. You have to... So you, everybody here starts firing, and the commander here tells his machine gun group to go over to that high point. It may just be 10, 12 feet higher than where this is. And uh, they don't move at all until this man gets in position and starts bringing down fire here, at which point this group starts to assault forward. And per perhaps with one side going first and the other side, mm -hmm. the commander might call odds and evens. But always somebody is firing on the bad guy whenever one group is moving. This group and this group will be firing when this group is moving. The idea is that as one, some, one person is advancing the, uh, and vulnerable, other groups are firing on the bad guys. So the, those, are the, those are the tactics. Uh, in addition, uh, huge, huge casualties were inflicted as the, the terrorists massed in groups, sometimes into the thousands, uh, in both Mozambique and in uh, Zambia, we launched tremendous raids. Tremendous raids were launched by the, by the SAS, the Rhodesian SAS, which has actually never stopped its <coughs> formal ties with the uh, with the British SAS. But, uh, so, and then also some new scouts did a number of raids. Uh, the RLI, Rhodesian Light Infantry, did a number of raids. That was an all-white group, uh, and they were all tremendously successful. At one point in uh, Mozambique. Uh, on the parade ground, when all of the communist trained guys were all in the parade ground, hundreds of them, a uh, uh, convoy of trucks rolled up right in front of them. The, the 
they rolled up the canvas in front with machine guns and mowed them down. <laughs> As, and then when they ran around, they ran into stop groups. Hundreds were killed, hundreds were killed. And I think there was maybe one casualty, uh, one casualty our side in that one. I was not involved in that. And similar things happened in Zambia because toward the end, it was very, very, uh, very, very difficult uh, situation. That's that. Uh, the other thing, um, uh, so what was it like? What was social life, life like? The social life was, you had 10 days off or five days off, and everyone went to either two major cities, either Bulawayo, which is a little to the south, or the, the, the main city, Harare. Now, we're not talking about a lot of people or big cities. Uh, probably at that time, Rhodesia pretended to have 300,000 people, but I doubt they had 100,000. The entire country of Rhodesia, uh, I think was never protected, never had more than maybe a thousand people on patrol. Uh, and so it was uh, just very, very few people. And what one learned about it is that it doesn't take many people. If everyone's on the same page, just a tiny number of people can do tremendous things. And that's what happened in Rhodesia. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, basically they ran out of, uh, there just was not, uh, just, a <coughs> just not enough reserves. Also, I wanted to show you something which will, which will give you an insight. I finally got a document uh, that I've been trying to get for a long time. I sent to the Chief of Intelligence, and his name is John Redford. He was Chief of All Military Intelligence. Uh, I said, listen, I'd like to find out some document that would link this whole, the, the communist link. Uh, and he, he uh, sent me one, finally. <coughs> and I'd like to... The, the present, um, the present uh, defense minister of, uh, of Zimbabwe. I think we'll turn this off here. How would you turn it off? Can we just turn it off? Switch. switch. Can we get the switch? Yeah. Wait a second. I think we. That's all right. It's, it's okay. Red <laughs> 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 switch. The present uh, <coughs> and always defense minister of Zimbabwe to this day and for the last 33 years is a guy called. Uh, possible name, Emerson Mgagwa. Emerson Mgagwa. Well, uh, I want to show you the Chinese link involved here. This came, uh, a special report, and that's a big, uh, ZANUs, meaning Zimbabwe African National Union's first group of five terrorists went to China for training on 22 September 1963. Remember, UDI was only 1965. Uh, the group was led by Emerson Ngagwa, uh, Zimbabwe's current minister, uh, minister of defense. No, but it gets more interesting. But that, that was when he was about 16 years old, it would have been, because he's only 65 now. This, the, uh, Zimbabwe's, uh, Harari's top newspaper, the top newspaper in town, actually reported this of a visit that happened earlier this year. And basically a Chinese delegation of generals have been visiting, have been, have been visiting Zimbabwe and enmeshed themselves in the ZANU-PF succession plots, meaning after Mugabe, Mugabe's now 88, has, has not been in good health for a long time. Robert Mugabe is the basic dictator mm -hmm. of, uh, of Zimbabwe. Anyway, uh, uh, a, uh, a secret pact rubber stamp by the aging Zimbabwe leader and his security uh, service chiefs. China thinks M Mgagwa is the one qualified to protect their vast economic interests in the country. Uh, uh, Minister Mgagwa exchanged gifts with the Chinese generals. So basically, all this time later, um, and it's been 49 and a half years, uh, he's, he's meeting probably for tea with the Chinese generals who would have been training him somewhere in Beijing uh, mm -hmm. that long ago. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. <coughs> what was the communist main interest in that country? Oh, tremendously. 60% uh, of all the, the Western world's uh, chromor is in a, a mountain range called the Great Dyke. Uh, and it runs diagonally through the country, basically all the way over. It's got all of this really, what's called high-grade lumping. But the Chinese now own a brand new diamond mine, 
which they have armed guards patrolling it right now and killing anybody who sets foot on it. They've all, they're also building a new intelligence and police training center right outside of Harare. The Chinese have a tremendous problem that Africa is helping to solve. One, they kill off all their little girls, as many as they can. So they're ending up with hundreds of millions of males that are going stir crazy for lack of women, for mature males. So they're sending them to Africa, and they are marrying into the local women, and they're living in these huts, these kayas, and then in the morning they go to work at copper, copper plants or, or any kind of factories and mills. So uh, the Chinese are steadfast. And let me tell you what the deal is, the quid pro quo. Uh, all of these corrupt leaders, and they're all corrupt in black Africa, they're all corrupt, it's just a matter of degrees. Um, and it's a culture, again, it's a cultural thing. There are no success, for you, success stories anywhere in black Africa that doesn't have a Euro dollar or, or Yankee dollar, excuse me, or Euro or Yankee dollar involved with it. Try to find one. I've been trying to find one for 50, 50 years. But so uh, this is the way it works. If anyone wants to take any action against the, any, any of these thug dictators like uh, Mugabe, I guess who sits on the Security Council? China vetoes it. It's that simple. So that's why you're near, near never anybody taking any action against any of the bad guys in Africa, because China is so invested economically in this whole area, and they have the same contempt for the African leadership that everybody else does, that everybody else does. Uh, it's just that uh, they, have, they have been steadfast. Uh, they've been a steadfast figure there and have been supportive of all these thugs, and so they get loyalty in return. They've come out on top, and uh, Russia's only just fell, fell behind. There was so much friction between Russia and China that on Independence Day, so-called when Mugabe took over in April of 1980, that there was almost a firefight between the, they almost didn't let the Russian plane land, the delegation to participate in that particular thing. I want to show you a few other things too. This is really something unofficial I got. Uh, uh, I found, I've been tracking to try to find out what the real numbers were in Rhodesia. Uh, well, communist terrorists killed inside of uh, Rhodesia. This is from the t total period of basically from 63 all the way through November of uh, 79. 13,332 uh, CTs wounded, 5,000 of uh, Rhodesian security allies forces killed, and this is 1259. Now remember, more than half of these were the African soldiers who were rapidly anti-communist. Um, so security forces wounded, uh, 7,000. Civilians killed by terrorists, this would be in the tribal trust lands, 9,512, that's what they call terrorists. Civilians wounded by uh, terrorists, 7,622. I also wanted to show you something that well, we're going to go back to that book. Something in here that, when we say terrorism, I'll tell you how you can get the allegiance of the of the locals. Didn't you say there's like a hundred thousand people living in Rhodesia at the time? I'm sorry, uh, I should have said a hundred thousand whites. Probably a hundred thousand whites and about five million Africans. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That was not clear. I'm very sorry about that. This is a. <coughs> somebody would get their lips talk cut off if someone felt like they were talking to my security forces in, in the middle of tribal trust lands, which were sectioned off areas to protect Africans from any sort of exploitation by whites. They were in tribal trust lands, and again, that's a, an opinion. That's an opinion. So this guy was a, tri a tri tribal leader, and he was shot. So it just goes on, you know, for nine thousand people. Or this is, by the way, the RPG seven. Uh, classic stuff. I wanted to read you, just don't think it was just uh, just Zimbabwe. This happened in uh, the area of Congo, uh, Brazzaville. Uh, this is about 600 children <coughs> came out in the, uh, the, the Sunday Mail. This was happened in, uh, published in October of 79. Basically, 600 kids were rounded up. They had tested well academically, very bright kids. They were rounded up by the Cubans and flown to um, Havana to begin a 15-year uh, training program. And now what's horrendous about that is their, their parents objected. They were told they were going on some sort of a scholarship thing, and then they were they were Shanghai, and uh, the, the school where they came from was compounded. There were troops around it. The parents were in prison for a while until they get the kids on. The kids got on the plane, were taken away, were basically Shanghai. 
And so this has been going on. And we had in Rhodesia something called the Manama, Manama Mission, where 100 kids were marched out and just marched across the border to Botswana. Do you remember the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, where all those kids were marched away? Well, they had the evil Afrikaner at the borders to it. But in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, in this case, or this happened many times in many missions. And there was very little religion going on in uh, Rhodesia when I was there because the World Council of Churches was busy financing the terrace. Uh, by the way, I happened to be a Catholic through my Irish heritage on my mom's side, Connecticut Irish. But uh, the Catholic Church was up to their ears supporting the, the terrace. All but maybe one mission, they were all up to their ears. Uh, so, pretty, pretty depressing to see. <coughs> I wanted to. This is a map of Rhodesia. If anyone wants to see it, but we had an ally. Uh, every, the my particular unit was the Rhodesian African Rifles, and the Queen Mother. Remember, who lived to be a hundred plus. Uh, she was our regimental, uh, the regimental colonel, so to speak. So every, th despite the fact that we were an outlaw colony, as much a pariah in the world then as it is now because we were the evil, don't forget, the evil white racist regime of Ian Smith. Uh, the royals, never, they maintained contact, uh, particularly uh, Queen Mother, and this is Prince Philip. Now they have, in, in UK, they have Remembrance Days every on, in November, and he would come, if they have, in the field of remembrance, and he dropped by to, uh, you know, basically to pay tribute. <coughs> Wouta took that picture. My wife back here. Mm -hmm. So what's funny is she, she's taking a picture, a full German, of a half German, because <laughs> <laughs> the royal family over there is about half German. They're funny. Uh, this is an article New York Times did on me uh, in which I talk about you know, what, a, what great fun it was to serve over there and how disappointed I was that our uh, election was not, uh, uh, was not recognized. The prime minister that we elected who I voted for, Bishop Abram, was very well. Uh, he was dropping in and flying in to uh, uh, thank me and my African soldiers for, for protecting a big section of the country uh, for that particular election. So I'm bemoaning the fact that we haven't been recognized. So how was the UN involved? In that? Didn't they put those in an embargo or something? Well, it was the UN. It was the UN ambassador <coughs> Andrew Young who was fighting, always the great champion of Mugabe. So he was fighting to be the fighting uh, to keep. So the USA was every bit as involved as the UK was in <laughs> imposing the communist rule that's there right now. Chinese back. Oh, and about the social, uh, the uh, during that particular time, uh, Rhodesia was an absolutely sex mad place. It was about like uh, about like London was during wartime London. Everybody was nervous. No one knew what was going on. So, what would happen? And uh, the sort of thing. My story is a classic story. Went to get a haircut. Just in country. Uh, the lady, a lovely lady with an hourglass figure. She would come over for Britain. She came over for the army but not to join it. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> she's, uh, so she said, well, you're my last com customer. And this is in downtown Bulawayo. She put the, the clothes sign there and closed down the blinds. And the next thing I know, five minutes into the haircut, I felt like I was, uh, what's her name? Uh, I mean, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, whirled away in a hurricane. <laughs> anyway, I get up <laughs> off the floor and then, uh, she has a little brush and it's dusting the the hair of the, all the, the days barbering off, and that, that was the start of a big romance. But it gets, that's the way it was in Virginia. Uh, so, but I, six months go by, and I come in with an and and she come, shows up with a very, very long face, and uh, I could tell something was really wrong, and I said, no. wrong, what's wrong, Mary? She said, you know, it's been a very, very cold winter. And I said, yeah. She said, you know, we have no central heating here in Virginia. She said, remember Frank? I said, yeah, that guy who never was in the service, you know, wasn't in the service and hangs out at the bar. She yells, well, because it got very cold, Columbus, and uh, I moved in with Frank. <laughs> 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 so, no, because of no central meeting. <laughs> so, of course. Oh, uh, but Frank died. Uh, and I'll tell you what. Right. I, uh, yeah. So, I, de I deployed with a very long face uh, back to the field again and 
special branch. They're the special police investigators. They, they ride out, and the guys, it's still cold. The guy's complaining when he arrives out there. They came, and I got pulled in from the field to investigate because Frank died. Frank died rather suddenly. Um, <laughs> so he calls me in from the field and said, you know, we understand you were dating this lady. I said, yeah. I said, well, this guy, we just want to find out what's going on here because what's her name? Mary was very in close proximity of him when he died. And, uh, <laughs> and so I said, well, uh, that guy, you know, is the only guy out of, I said, what, what do you know about it? I said, I don't, I don't know about <coughs> it. She said, well, the guy had a, we do know this, the guy had a heart condition. I said, well, I'll tell you this. I said, uh, uh, Mary wasn't exactly like a SEAL Team 6 selection course, but she was a pretty vigorous lady. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mary killed the only guy I never saw in uniform. <laughs> 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 And Mike, uh, this is what happened. This is, and so uh, women so worried about keeping the morale up of the troops, they, oh, yeah. they let that get in the way of, <laughs> you know, engagements, marriages. So <coughs> that's the way it was. I, oh, yeah. so the scene was this: you would a whole train load of uh, soldiers would get off the, would be coming in when the train load was leaving. And so there'd be some lady uh, standing there on the train dock, weeping, of course. And, that would activate the gallant instincts of the soldier getting off. <laughs> and he would, in any case, she was calling him by some different fellow's name in no time at all, which is not disconcerting, only the timing is disconcerting. <laughs> 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 That's the way it was. I wish there was some sort of religious uh, tone to it, but we were very, very dedicated in, in, the, Cold, in the Cold War effort. Everybody saw it that way. Uh, and we saw this other as a menace. We knew that the liberation movement would not liberate anybody, and that's the way it turned out. It turned out that way. Now, any other? We've had some really good questions. Any other good questions about yeah. tactics or anything else? Go ahead. How were you recruited in the first place? Was it Soldier of Fortune or something like that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. A man among men. By the way, Robert K. Brown, I, his very first story, his very first, I've done some articles for him about a CIA plot, the CIA plot, which I'll mention in just a minute. Uh, I've done a number of stories. Uh, but he, he, he was not by them. Uh, a major uh, knocked on my door and said, anyway, we know you got a good record in Vietnam. Would you like to sign up for a three-year uh, a th uh, three contract? And I said, yes. Of course, there's another big factor here. So what motivated people? First of all, uh, well, in any case, the Vietnam veterans were very, very bitter that, that we were losing that war. They were very bitter. Uh, and in my particular case, there was a bitterness, but also I really liked the challenge. There was a third case going through a really nasty divorce. Uh, and uh, so it, I was actually f fearful I might have rash thoughts uh, about doing something toward my ex-wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought it might be a good time to get away for a while. <laughs> so that's uh, so I was recruited by a major uh, who knocked on my door in Santa Fe. Hey, would like to come over? I said, yeah. I need to get away for a while. Was this major in the U.S. Army? No, or he's, he's <coughs> so, so somebody was going around and yeah, they found out. your name somehow, huh? Yeah, but when I got over there, I had to <coughs> present uh, uh, my DD-214, which, strange enough, was faxed to Tel Aviv. And the Israelis, with their contact in the Pentagon, made sure that my DD-14 was correct, accurate. Uh, huh. And so they verified it. Now, I've got to tell you about a CIA plot that came over at the end. The CIA pretended to be an, uh, pretended to be a friend of Rhodesia, and at the 11th hour, knowing we were on our last legs to provide national support, I never lost a battle, by the way, but uh, they came over headed by a guy called Robin Moore, uh, who, wrote the so who wrote the Green Berets, which was, of course, my old unit. Uh, uh, he wrote, and he came over with a guy called Vernon Gillespie, who was the, the model for uh, John Wayne in the movie, the Green Braves. So this guy was a decorated Vietnam guy, and they came over pretending to come in, in, in the clear. We're the CIA conservative branch. We want to help you. But what they were doing was collecting information on all the Yanks and uh, sending it back. But they were doing worse than that. One of the one of the Yanks. This is why I stayed away from all the other Americans there. Uh, one of the guys that I was suspicious of, uh, working for the CIA, he was busy handing information directly to the terrorists, directly to the enemy. Uh, so this was going on. So at that particular time, toward the end of the war, you had UK against us, you had the USA against us, uh, the CIA against us, so the East and the West, uh, to say nothing of the communists, so we were in a certain pressure cooker, a horrible pressure cooker during the Cold War Chester. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And we just, just finally ran out of reserves. 
they asked me to extend, and that last month they asked me to extend another month, and I did, so I did a total of 37 months. Don't regret one day, I've had a wonderful experience. I got a question, it's not military. What was it like having typhoid? That must have been bad. I, there, I found out there are many, many kinds of typhoids. My particular type, I got just kind of weak in the middle of the day. Middle, middle of the day. Other stuff will make you real sick and kill you dead. Well, I mean, the other type. Yeah, it will. And what happened was uh, that uh, we just ran out of water. We just ran out of water. And mm -hmm. there was a little pool of water as big as this table, got down on my hands and knees and my African shoulders. We were happy to get it and drank it. But it was slimy. Mm -hmm. All the cows would stand around it. Oh, they would drink yeah. it and then urinate. It would go into there. And <laughs> I feel the slime, could feel the slime going between my teeth. And it just was grand <laughs> getting a drink of water. <laughs> Oh, another little story about Africans. Uh, we were in the middle of a place called Matibi It It's dry, 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 and uh, suddenly we couldn't find any water. So suddenly, I'm the so-called leader. I'm one of nine, and suddenly the the pace of the Africans pick up, and we walk. They walk for two hours. Suddenly, I'm just another croupy in this crowd, and they walk straight to a water pump uh, in the middle of nowhere, a hand pump, uh, and uh, they smelled it smelled it. There was only a light breeze going, but they smelled it. Somebody had kindly left something, some water to prime the pump. We got some water going. That was a happy day. <laughs> also, one of my soldiers got, got um, really taken down by uh, the witch doctor, possessed by evil spirits. Now, what had happened was that they had, uh, the Africans have, uh, our soldiers had very strong taboos on certain sexual activities. So he'd come back to the bush, his girlfriend had sent him a letter and said, basically, ha, ha. We just violated a rule. I was supposed to wait six months to, after sex or um, a miscarriage before you can have sex again. Um, excuse me, after a miscarriage or birth, have to wait. Well, well, guess what? I didn't. So this guy was suddenly possessed by evil spirits, um, and in the middle of formation, he collapsed. Is rolling around. He did not have epilepsy. He'd been a <coughs> wonderful soldier up to then. Just rolling around on the ground. The African sergeants, myself, we all hopped back. It was horrifying. I brought in medical doctors. They could find nothing wrong with him. Meanwhile, he's in the stands. Good Catholic that I am, I brought in a witch doctor <laughs> <laughs> to perform an exorcism. <laughs> and so, uh, with $20 out of my back pocket, I paid this guy. His exorcism didn't work. And uh, uh, so we had to send him back to the tribal trust land. And nobody jokes about it, but witchcraft in Africa. Hmm. I'm just wondering, were there any repercussions to you personally when you came back from Rhodesia? By our government? Yes, I was the most current uh, anti terrorist, uh, rural anti terrorist guy around. I was 10 years ahead of all my Vietnam contemporaries, mm -hmm. and I tried to get a job right away with the Vanell Corporation, which is a part of this kind of a CIA kind of deal, and, and, the many, and others. And they said, hey, wow, you got a lot of resume here. We don't anybody like that. We'll get right back to you. I called back, said, oh, well, we filled that. This happened again and again. So I was blackballed. Mm -hmm. uh, from any uh, getting any kind of security job with any company that was in, uh, at all involved with, uh, 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 you know, the CIA government, because of, yeah, I was being tracked. Uh, you bet I was. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have any regrets about that. It was a wonderful three years. Felt good then. Feels good now. Good. Um, how how did you guys get uh, ammunition and weaponry over there? Was uh, was there was an embargo? Yeah, there was some. We had something called Southern Airlines, and we would load it with beef, fly it to Belgium, and exchange beef for uh, FN rifles and ammunition. <coughs> Seven six two uh, NATO. And that's the way it did. All uh, so we we did a lot of things like that. It was all um, under the table stuff because uh, I had I had no choice. And the, the Rhodesian currency was not worth anything outside of Rhodesia. But again, I was uh, I was rich. <laughs> did you ever have a chance to meet Old Smithy? Yeah, Charlie? I did. I did. I met him. I went first there as a journalist. I met him, walked right up. He was, it was the opening of Parliament. He was standing. He didn't have any security whatsoever. I walked up, shook his hand. And what I noticed about him uh, is that uh, his whole face was uh, frozen, one half of it, because he uh, was in a terrible uh, accident. In the Second World War, he's a pilot. Pilot, yeah. And uh, it just uh, so he had a lot of plastic surgery. One half of his face was completely frozen. A nice guy. Uh, he, he seemed like a very nice man. He was impatient for the president to, to roll up in this carriage for the only parliament. Uh, somebody's got a picture of that too. He had no security whatsoever. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Isn't uh, fast forwarding to today? Isn't the currency pretty much? Oh, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, and, and uh, from what I read, I read that a lot of the farms that used to be managed by 
white farmers, they chase them off and nobody knows how to handle them now, so they have other well, that's, problems. That, but to get back to the, when I arrived there, the Rhodesian dollar was incredibly powerful. It, it took one dollar, 1.75 US dollars to equal a Rhodesian dollar. So it was incredibly powerful. Now, what happened between uh, 2000 and 2005 was a took over <coughs> about 4,500, all, basically all the farms in Zimbabwe were just taken over by so-called former terrorists. But every, every, and it was, what happened is these rich farms, which were as well run as any sort of a Texas rice farm or any highly sophisticated, they're all, all the irrigation pipe has been stolen, sold off. Every fixture in the farm has been stolen. They're all fallow. They're all, so they're depending upon the food being shipped in. Even during the war, we were sending excess food to our enemies on either side just because they were starving. Uh, we're talking about Zambia and Mozambique, just carloads of grain and everything else. It was a, well, it was a Shangri-La. Uh, Rhodesia was an absolute Shangri-La. And during election day, and I thought I had the picture, uh, some pictures were taken. Every African there was, um, 10 to 15 pounds overweight, uh, the attitude toward Africans was absolutely paternalistic, absolutely without any question. And they were fed and this type of thing. So uh, on that, I never saw, by the way, I never saw any poverty. They could be labeled poverty. And I never saw any slums. It just wasn't permitted. Wow. Did you know that uh, Mugabe just took Smith's farm? I didn't know that. Yeah. I saw Thanks. it in the news the other day, just yeah. a couple days ago. I didn't know that. I missed that. Just took it. And I know that his wife also... Has it been in his family? For, did it bring, even after he died, it stayed in his family? Oh, wow. Yeah, his ashes were just deposited there like 2007 yeah. when he died. Wow. What's that again? Oh, I said his ashes returned there like in 2007 when he passed away. And mm -hmm. yeah. So they just forcibly took the, the land? He's campaigning on 100% this time. 51% of the land's not enough. He's, he's saying 100% this time, Mugabe. Strangely, uh, I, I confronted Andrew Young three days, three years ago, right here at Portman State when he was there. I said, listen, you know, uh, he was quite embarrassed. I said, you, you were the guy, you and Carter promoted, uh, were really promoting uh, Mugabe, despite the fact we told you at the time that he was the full Marxist here, that he was the worst possible news. And he was a very embarrassed. Uh, and I never, it was very difficult for me to do that. But he was very embarrassed and basically told the story, well, he was a good guy gone bad. And he and Carter got their stories together. I, I've, I've, I've really, <coughs> with letters to the Carter Center, really let Carter know it. I said, listen, use all your prestige to come out and condemn the man. And he wrote me back a very blistering note. Uh, but in any case, what they both done is, well, he was a good guy when we knew him, he's a good guy gone bad. And so Carter, it was, Basically, Carter had a lot on his plate there, and he said, Andrew, you got me the vote that got me into the office here. I said, whatever you want, you got the portfolio for Africa. Whatever you want, to, uh, I'll rubber stamp it. And so that's what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite a sad story. And Andrew Young, by the way, <coughs> interesting guy. Um, none of the people he was speaking to at the uh, University of Portland had any idea about it that <coughs> it was important to our civil rights movement. Didn't, uh, didn't have a clue. And one guy, hundreds of people leaving this lecture hall, said, wasn't he the mayor of Atlanta or something? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks like, by the way, an old southern gentleman um, uh, that came out of a uh, movie of the 30s. He's very much a southern gentleman kind of guy, lighter than I am. Wow. <laughs> Carter's always been on the wrong side of everything international. <laughs> oh, uh, I want to show you something uh, one, one question back here. Yeah. Uh, Captain, did you, uh, the, the enemy, the Chinese, and the... Uh, Russians, did they, you said they used the SKS and the AKs, mm -hmm. and did your side use any of those? Occasionally some of our special operations groups did, uh, some th the, the Salus Gauss did, because what they did was pseudo-ops, they in infiltrated the terrorists, uh, and uh, of course they used all their weapons, they sung all their Chimarenga songs, knew all of those by heart, the liberation songs. Yeah, they used them, and I'm sure that our SAS, a wonderful unit, the SAS units used them too on, on foreign ops. I wanted to show you something here. Whoops. If you if you wanted to know why the uh, uh, why the there was tremendous push on all the British colonies to either we'll give you independence if you go for majority rule. I wanted to explain why the uh, uh, this is a pack I carried. I think I mentioned that this is a you've heard of the Mau Mau thing that happened in Kenya. Uh, well, this was actually given to me by a girlfriend in Salisbury, uh, 
and she said it was had bad memories. They came from, during the Mau Mau thing, they emigrated from Nairobi down to where uh, her father was a, a chemist, a pharmacist there. Uh, they migrated down to Rhodesia, and she gave this to me uh, and said, uh, this was used to chop up my cousin. <laughs> and uh, they made them out of, I've never touched it, but these are all made out of leaf springs on cars. It's called a semi, it's a machete, it's about 18 inches long. And you can see all chips on here. And these were chips from, you wonder what chips from bones look like, this would have been this. Now, what's interesting about that, the Mau Mau's, the Kikuyu's, it was all part of the liberation movement. And uh, the army traced this group down with, who killed 34 uh, basically settlers in the middle of nowhere, a total of 34, but another 1,800 um, uh, Africans. And that was all part of the so-called liberation movement. So uh, they wanted, uh, the people who came from Kenya wanted nothing to do with that. So, and in addition, in uh, Belgium simply gave the Belgian Congo in the parliament by a stroke of the pen, gave them independence. Well, after that, an outfit called the Simbas that uh, Major Mike Hoare chased around, they did horrible things. They went to all the, the yeah, the Belgium, uh, the Belgium Catholic missionaries, uh, missions, convents, <coughs> rounded up all the, the nuns, and well, it was too horrible. Too much information. So you have two things going on. The why they didn't up for independence. One, the fact that there was no demonstration that it, it had ever worked. And two, uh, the, the backing by the communists. Now, having said all this, we need to do independent research and to find out the other side. Because I'd frankly like to know, uh, uh, anyway, uh, what your opinion is. But there are no good stories coming out of Africa, and that's because of a, a culture which is terribly, terribly uh, misogynist and uh, locked in a world of spirits. And I have a totally different look at colonialism. Colonialism kept like a lien on a pressure cooker, tribalism tamped down. You saw what happened in Rwanda when suddenly the French left. Well, the Tutsis went, uh, excuse me, the, the Hutu went and chopped the Tutsis, you know, really, literally chopped them right down here, gave them a split personality, killed about 600,000. Yeah, so everything terrible. comes back, it comes back up. So I don't go on with this idea that the colonials, what happened in, is that the, uh, Africa is just resetting, just rebooting to uh, the way it was, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. Wow. Go ahead. Do you think there's any hope that Zimbabwe will ever get truly liberated, not be communist no. anymore? No, hope for Africa. Maybe the only hope, oddly enough, is uh, China, and that's no hope for us. That's right. <laughs> so China has been a plus for Africa, but not a plus for anybody else. They're building railroads and mines and factories all over Africa, yeah. and basically stripping of its resources. I get in their camp. Yeah. Wow, it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Are you quite welcome for serving over there? Oh, yeah.